2012, associate professor at University of Alabama, U.S. First of all, I express my gratitude and thank Dr. Bhopendra ji for accepting our request to deliver a lecture on future sustainable fuels. Thank you, sir. Thank you for accepting our request. Before starting the lecture, I would like to introduce our esteemed speaker, Dr. Bhupendra Ji. Dr. Bhupendra Khandelwal is working as an associate professor for fuels and combustion at the University of Alabama. He is working on combustion, emissions, and performance of alternative fuel to be used in gas turbine engines and other combustion sources. Prior to this position, Dr. Khandelwal held a position of assistant professor at the University of Sheffield in the Low Carbon Combustion Center. He was leading combustion and emissions research area at Low Carbon Combustion Center. He is also visiting professor at Aerospace Department, IIT Bombay. Dr. Khandelwal serves as a technical area organizer for AIAA conferences and as a reviewer for different scientific journals and US DOE for alternative fuels related projects. He is point of contact for ASME Turbo Expo 2020 on behalf of the Alternative Fuels Technical Committee. His research on fuels, emissions, combustion and combustors is widely published in journals and conferences. So with this, I, I invite Dr. Bhupendra Khandelwal for the lecture on future sustainable fuels. So over to you, sir. Right. Uh, thanks a lot, Professor Singh, for giving a detailed introduction. So maybe I'll just share my screen. Uh, one quick point to all of you, if you want to ask any questions, you can just uh, send them in chat box. <clears throat> all right, so uh, coming to future sustainable fuels, what we will discuss today is uh, what is the overall impact of uh, today's fuels? Uh, in terms of emissions, in terms of performance, what actually happens in a gas turbine combustor. Then we'll look at uh, status of some uh, <clears throat> current uh, emissions from like NOx, CO, CO2, PM, what is being generated by different alternative fuels. And we'll look at uh, what options we can actually have looking at future. Right, so that's going to be a bit of overview for the, uh, today's uh, presentation. So as far as uh, <clears throat> the impact of alternative fuel is concerned, actually this figure on the left you can see on your screen, basically this is showing radiative forcing. That means in terms of uh, global warming potential of a particular gas, how much global warming potential particular species of uh, emissions could have. So you can clearly see like zero is zero global warming potential. Anything on the left, that means it can lead to Reduction in global warming potential, anything on the right can lead to increase in uh, global warming potential. One thing I would like to clarify is that majority of these studies in my presentation, they are according to before COVID, right? So like you see here, growth in aviation, almost 5% per annum. We don't know whether we will be able to sustain that growth any, any longer or not, but uh, I would say, Further updated figures will take some time to come up, but this is what it is for now. So if you look at this, then uh, if you uh, the, like CO2 emissions has uh, a particular global warming potential, then this is the error bar, which actually shows like how much could be the error in that particular uh, uh, reading. And similarly, ozone and other things. <clears throat> One thing you would note here is basically induced cirrus clouds. So, uh, the water vapor which we actually, or cirrus clouds which we actually emit as in um, aviation, we don't have any solid block. That means we don't have enough data or enough knowledge around the area in terms of how much emissions it will actually produce. And that's why you see a big box and with a slightly larger error margin. And if you look at total aviation, global warming potential will lie somewhere here and with a big error margin, but if we take induced cirrus clouds into picture, then the error margin becomes significantly bigger. So we might be producing two, two and a half times of uh, global warming potential gases as compared to what we are able to currently say. All right. 
and according to different reports we can we clearly know that uh, um, aviation is responsible for between 2 and 3% of co2 emissions and it's going up no matter what currently we are saying that uh, okay uh, aviation has taken a big hit but at the same time even vehicular traffic on road has taken a big hit so everything has gone down appropriately and things would go up again All right and uh, by 2028 they, we are expecting that there would be about 32000 aircrafts and uh, one more thing which we need to make sure is uh, we hear these days that uh, uh, for an example quantas is retiring a380s and big aircrafts so majority of the people are retiring bigger aircrafts because they, there might not be enough passenger load now but at the same time uh, the production is there so retiring big aircraft doesn't mean that the number of aircrafts is going to go down right so if you look at historical trends this actually shows uh, the fuel uh, percentage of fuel reduction which we have uh, managed to achieve in last uh, 60 odd years so what you see here is we started with Comet 4 and we have managed to reduce engine fuel consumption by about 50%. So it's a remarkable reduction which we have achieved in the last 50, um, 60 odd years. And we have managed to reduce per seat fuel consumption by about 82%. So uh, that's also a remarkable achievement that we have managed to reduce per seat uh, fuel consumption by about 82%. We're talking about these latest aircrafts like uh, Boeing 787. Boeing 737 MAX is not there. Right, so basically you can clearly see that uh, we have managed to reduce the fuel consumption, but at the same time, um, as the number of aircrafts are increasing, even if you look at uh, these days, here about like Delta or Virgin and uh, other airlines what they say is okay there's a slump going on for now but uh, the future uh, basically they're looking at more sustainable so they want to put more and more sustainable fuels in the aircraft even Rolls-Royce they are building a new test bed in Derby for now it's a, one of the largest test, test beds in the world and they're building a alternative fuel tank around it so that they can actually test different alternative fuels, sustainable fuels moving forward. Right, so I have myself tested large range of uh, sustainable fuels for Rolls-Royce in the past. So uh, before we go into much more technical details of uh, what actually happens uh, <clears throat> uh, with fuels, there are a few things which, uh, basics which I wanted to cover. For an example, what actually happens, uh, I mean, for NOx production and CO production. One thing to note is <clears throat> basically a stoichiometric mixture is the mixture where we supply just the right amount of fuel and right amount of air <clears throat> in the fuel mixture and it can burn. Right, but we all know that if we supply just the right amount of fuel and right amount of air, theoretical air, theoretical fuel, then all the fuel molecules might not be able to reach air molecules and we might not have full burning. So that's why we supply slightly more air. That's why we come to the leaner side and uh, <clears throat> we supply slightly more air so that we can actually burn all the fuel. But when we burn all the fuel, what actually happens is our temperature actually goes up. That's why you see that NOx emissions are higher just on the slightly right to, towards uh, of this graph because the temperatures are very high. We are able to burn all the fuels and that's why the NOx are also very high. And the CO and uh, unburned hydrocarbons are low. So we try to avoid this high NOx area. So you can clearly see the NOx goes up substantially high with temperature. Another thing which you see here is basically this figure on the right. You can clearly see how the NOx is going up exponentially high with increasing temperature. And if we reduce the temperature, how the CO goes up. So somehow being an aerospace and combustion engineers, we need to make sure that the temperatures are maintained within this range in the combustion chamber so that we will end up producing lower emissions. 
Right. Few years ago, I was watching this documentary that uh, there was a big issue going on in terms of uh, what will actually happen uh, <clears throat> when there was a Heathrow Airport expansion was being proposed, and what would actually happen when uh, the airport will go uh, live. I mean, when the government will uh, build the airport, and this was the snapshot. This is a snapshot of one of that documentary. And what you can clearly see here is if a new runway is built, uh, the NOx emissions could go higher uh, by a significant amount, and it can lead to eviction of about 35,000 people. So that's a significant amount, right? And uh, by help of sustainable fuels, let's see if we can actually do something about it. So the, from the report which I had seen, uh, basically these are the NOx emissions around Heathrow Airport. So what you see here is like five microgram per meter cube, then 10, 15, and this is 30 around the runway, right? So this is one of the plots of Heathrow Airport and how the NOx is actually changing around the airport. You can clearly see it and it's remarkable to see that, okay, around the airport, your NOx are higher. So from this graph, we can say that. But let's look at another graph, which actually pinpoints different test stations, right? And what we see here is basically that's where, where my cursor is now. That's where the airport is, right? This particular red point is on airport site, right? And as this is on airport site, this is this site does not falls under uh, EU regulations for NOx emissions. These two particular sites are roads leading in and around airport and residential areas and things like that. And this site is a road leading to uh, the airport. So you can clearly see these are some of the roads and these four red dots are the dots where the NOx emissions are higher than the current regulations. And out of those four dots, there's one dot which is actually falling on the airport and three are on the roadside, right? And uh, <clears throat> now we will look at the uh, a bit more detail. So currently, if you look at these two, these two are falling on the airport. These two are falling on uh, the commercial or residential side. We've got to do something anyway to reduce this NOx emissions. Right, so let's look into a bit more detail. So this is a zoomed version of the airport site. And what you see here is about 25% of NOx emissions are coming from uh, aircraft and APUs, round about 25. Background NOx is one third and the road traffic is about one third. So you can clearly see how even on airport, only about 25% of NOx is actually coming from aircraft and some from APU. So APU is because on ground, we can constantly run APU. So that's why they form a major part of uh, the NOx emissions coming here, All right? So uh, another graph looking at uh, life cycle assessment of these uh, different fuels now. So previously when we had a look, we were I was showing you how different gases actually lead to different uh, uh, global warming potential. Now I'm showing you a plot where zero is, that means net zero CO2 emissions. Anything on the right means it's showing, it's giving higher CO2 emissions. Anything on the left is showing uh, negative CO2 emissions. And what you see here is basically uh, different fuels. So like palm oil to fuel, uh, fuel, soy to fuel, CTL is coal to fuel, oil shale, um, CTL, coal to liquid, plus carbon capture, CCS, then uh, rapeseed oil and different fuels and how they will like, they are actually impacting uh, uh, CO2 emissions. There's one point you would notice here is basically this light pinkish uh, bar. This is the biggest in here. So what they have considered is the change in land use. So when you actually change the production of food. So for an example, if a farmer is growing fruit for now and uh, he changes food production to oil production crop. So you have changed the cha use of the land. 
and the food production has to go somewhere else or there might be scarcity of few food and things like that so there are only two or three studies which have actually considered change in land use where uh, other studies which have shown given these numbers even though they are growing jatropha or palm or camelina they have not considered what would be the uh, change in land use co2 emissions so being an engineer we need to actually make sure that we are calculating the full co2 emissions as compared to skipping some parts of it okay so when we consider full co2 emissions things might look totally different so in the current situation you can clearly see how when they have considered change in land use how the co2 emissions would actually totally change right and uh, when we look at any studies uh, just to inform you that under current situation both on european side and american side uh, the net life cycle uh, assessment uh, calculation methodologies does not exist so people calculate according to the way they they feel they they comfortable with so currently there are no standards which can actually calculate what would be the life cycle assessment right so even though um, uh, we have been doing so much research on aviation fuels but we don't have standards to calculate the life cycle assessment coming uh, from see of co2 emissions coming from these aviation fuels right so like this is a snapshot of few flights which has happened in uh, 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 about a decade ago and um, one means is a baseline you've considered against jet a, jet a and any, anything above it that means it's producing higher co2 anything below it, it that means it is producing lower co2 emissions and you can clearly see some of the flights have happened and uh, if we look for uh, these alternative fuels or sustainable fuels could be divided into two categories one is supply of security or security of supply and one is security of environment because some of the fuels which might be might be slightly easier to get but they might not be as environmental friendly as we want and there, there are some fuels which are more which could be more environmental friendly but we don't know out of these studies which one is actually more uh, which one is actually considered everything into picture in terms of all the calculations which you have to do right so whenever we look at these reports like okay this fuel is producing lower co2 emissions or this fuel is producing higher co2 emissions we need to make sure to know that uh, what calculations they have done right so this is a co2 emissions or a fuel flow uh, difference when we are considering two different types of fuels so there was a, a test campaign by uh, air force research labs in us what was done was the ran the aircraft on the same uh, trajectory and what was observed was that there was a reduction in fuel consumption right so the reduction was about one and a half to two percent so it's a significant reduction if we say that if we if by using biofuels we are able to reduce the fuel consumption yes we can clearly say that okay the reduction is there but we need to go into a bit more technical details of it so what has actually happened is basically in this case is the carbon to hydrogen ratio of the fuel has changed so as there is in this biofuel there is more hydrogen in picture the overall density of the fuel so density per unit uh, so as the density has reduced the mass flow has reduced right so when you talk about carbon to hydrogen ratio in fuel overall the density has reduced when we actually use biofuels and when the density has actually reduced the fuel flow goes down if we are because the engines are normally uh, set up in a way that they will produce a particular thrust or particular temperature in your gas turbines so at this fuel more mass was needed and for this fuel less mass was needed i'm talking about mass not volume keep that in mind okay so that in this fuel the particular density has actually reduced so let's look at some combustion properties and 
uh, if we look at uh, current emissions standards, just to inform you that uh, in majority of the world, we only regulate exhaust emissions only for landing and takeoff cycle. We don't regulate what's happening at cruise. And uh, I've been asking industry the question that, uh, uh, when are the regulations coming for cruise? But currently, to date, there are no regulations. There are talks going on that uh, we need to have regulations at cruise as well. But under current situation, there are none. <clears throat> so let's look at some NOx emissions data for now. So basically, as you all are studying uh, aerospace and as you all are in third year and fourth year, basically, you should know by now that when a pilot is setting up uh, a particular aircraft, I mean, is taking off the aircraft, what he sets is a thrust. Like, I want this much thrust for an example. Power conditions, right? Like 75% power, 80% power. The pilot will actually not decide how much fuel needs to go in. What he would decide is, I want 80,000 pounds of thrust or 100,000 pounds of thrust. So 80% power, 100% power, like that. Right? From previous slides, what you have seen is basically uh, the NOx emissions are purely dependent on temperature. So just to inform you that uh, we don't actually allow any NOx emissions, uh, sorry, any fuel bound nitrogen in our jet fuel. So whatever NOx is getting produced, majority of it is coming in terms of thermal NOx Thermal NOx I mean here is basically the NOx which will actually get produced due to higher temperatures in the combustion chamber, right? So uh, the reason I'm explaining all this is basically the pilot will actually set up a particular power setting. That means pilot will actually set up a particular temperature in the combustion cha chamber, right? And when uh, the requirement is a particular uh, temperature, if we talk about NOx, then alternative fuels should not be able to actually change the NOx much. Does that make sense? Because NOx is actually dependent on temperature and we are aiming for the same temperature in our combustion chambers so that we can get the thrust which we actually want. Right. So by changing the fuel, we can't change NOx much. So I've tested close to about 200 odd fuels in the last eight, nine years. And I'm showing some of the fuels which I've tested in uh, 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 one of the gas turbines which we ha had. And this is a snapshot of some of the fuels. So what you see here is majority, I mean, at the same operating condition, majority of the fuels are producing similar level of NOx emissions. What you see here is they might go slightly up and down, but uh, all these instruments by which the industry actually measures NOx emissions, they have got their sensitivity in error bars. So if I put error bars on these, they all might look exactly the same, right? So technically, the takeaway yet is basically, uh, we cannot change NOx much by changing the fuel because we don't allow fuel bound nitrogen in aviation anyway. And when we set up a particular operating condition for gas turbines. We set up what temperature we wanted before the turbine and what thrust we want. And technically we should not see much change in NOx. We might be able to change it like by three, four percent, five percent. But if somebody comes and says that oh, my fuel is producing 20 percent lower NOx emissions, technically we've got to rethink about it. 20 percent, is it even practical without playing with uh, the power setting of the engine, right? So that's a snapshot from NOx, NOx point of view. Then as far as CO2 is concerned, there are quite a few airlines, they report, they've reported that uh, the CO2 saving is there and technically what it is, right? So we had also done some testing. You can clearly see in this graph that we were running a, a bio SPK blend and jet A blend. So we saw that the fuel flow is changing, right? But you need to look at the Y axis as well, that this is fuel flow in pounds per hour, right? So 
11,600. So that's where it is starting. So fuel flow is not changing much. It's changing by very, very little amount. Okay. And the reason is basically as we change the fuel, what actually happens is our carbon to hydrogen ratio in the fuel actually changes. So our energy per unit volume changes and our energy per unit mass also changes. So as we are able to supply similar amount of energy by uh, using less amount of mass, I'm talking about mass for now, not volume, by using less amount of mass, then uh, in terms of uh, the mass which is used for providing a particular amount of energy that goes down. So eventually our fuel flow in terms of mass actually goes down and that's what we have reported. I hope it makes much more sense now that uh, the CO2 emissions is a direct output of carbon to hydrogen ratio in the fuel. You can't change it much Otherwise, you will play with fuel very badly. You will have, uh, these are like some of the extreme ranges from 42 megajoules to about 44, or maybe say you can go to 40 to 46, but you can't change it much. And eventually uh, what you're changing is the carbon to hydrogen ratio in the fuel. So just by looking at carbon to hydrogen ratio in the fuel, you can actually calculate how much CO2 benefit you will have, right? So that's from CO2 emissions point of view. So this is again a snapshot out of eight, I mean, 200 odd fuels, which I have tested in recent years. And what you see here is the CO2 emissions, how they are changing. But one point to note here is basically this axis is starting at 3100. So if you look at the bigger picture, you're barely changing the CO2 emissions. Right, okay, changing by, by about one, one and a half percent, but we can't change it much because it is it purely dependent on carbon to hydrogen ratio in the fuel. Now coming to unburnt hydrocarbons, right? So you, you had a look at uh, NOx emissions that we cannot change NOx emissions much based just on fuel because it is more of a temperature impact and temperature is actually controlled by what power setting we run. We cannot change CO2. We might change it like by one and a half percent, two percent, but we cannot change it much. Reason being it's an impact of carbon to hydrogen ratio in the fuel. Now coming at unburned hydrocarbon or total hydrocarbon coming out of. So basically the fuel which gets unburned, which gets emitted out of the aircraft unburned. So if you look here, you see, you can see that there's a big difference. But again, if you look at the axis, it's starting from 30. So plus minus about 10% you might be able to change because some fuels are slightly difficult to burn as compared to others. But uh, as far as unburnt hydrocarbon is concerned, it's mostly a property of fuel injector and engine as compared to fuel itself, unless you take a very bad fuel. But in that case, that particular bed fuel might not be approved as a jet fuel anyway, right? Because there's a, there are particular requirements in terms of what should be the surface tension of fuel, what should be the viscosity of fuel, and all those things actually impact uh, the unburnt hydrocarbons. So in this case, if we are talking about approved jet fuels around the world, then they give kind of similar stories, plus minus 10% in terms of uh, hydrocarbon changes. Right, so uh, basically, uh, there's one thing which uh, uh, happened a few years, I mean, not a few years, about eight years ago with me. I was testing different fuels in a, a gas turbine and I was standing outside the test cell and I could feel the difference in vibrations coming to me through the ground. And I could feel, even though I was wearing ear defenders, I could feel the change in noise when I was changing the fuel. Right, so as in when I change from a jet fuel to a different fuel, I could actually feel, okay, the vibrations have changed, which are coming from ground and the noise has changed. That's when I started investigating what could be actually the impact. And I discussed with some major airlines as well that uh, uh, have pilots or other people reported uh, change in noise and vibrations when they actually put different fuels. And 
this is what I found. I mean, this is basically research going on from last eight or eight odd years and uh, will carry on for a few more years now. And I, we purchased Jet A fuel, Jet A1 from two different sources, then a coal to liquid fuel and a gas to liquid fuel we purchased. And what we saw was that Jet A was giving vibrational uh, frequency at the same hertz but the amplitude was different because just to inform you that each batch of these jet a fuels would be slightly different in their specifications right so if somebody comes and says that jet a produce, uh, jet a one fuel uh, purchase from delhi would be exactly same purchase from M M mumbai that's not the case each batch is different because there's always a range and uh, companies have to make sure that they actually follow the range, but they can't, they can't achieve exact pinpointed values, right? So two uh, jet a source from two different sources, giving completely different vibrations, coal to liquid, giving completely different vibrations, gas to liquid, giving completely different vibrations, right? And uh, that led us to believe that yes, the fuel is actually changing vibrations and noise and we've got to look at it right uh, it's not very easy to just say oh nothing happens because what if some of these frequencies are matching up with resonance frequency and other and, and it can lead to issues it can lead to maintenance issues it can lead to component failure issues right so we've started looking at these in much more detail in recent years so uh, you've seen NOx, CO, CO2 and things like that. And you've seen that uh, how these things change. And you have also seen how noise and vibrations can actually change when we change the fuels. Now, what exactly is changing with time? So if we look at a normal uh, gas chromatograph of uh, uh, aviation kerosene or aviation fuel, we're looking at species between C10 and C24, some of them lower, some of them higher, and they, they follow this kind of trend. And what has been happening in recent years is, basically this range has been getting narrower and narrower. So as we are moving towards more and more environmental friendly fuels, what exactly is happening is the, initially we were planning of going like five, six species kind of fuels. Now there are talks going on that, why don't we use just two species fuels as compared to hundreds of species in a normal aviation kerosene? Why don't we actually just use two or three species fuels and uh, produce them? So what exactly is happening is, as we are moving towards more and more greener fuels, there's a particular portion which is missing. That is, we are missing actually the aromatic fraction. Aromatic fraction I mean here is like, uh, compounds uh, which are slightly longer in chains, like cyclic chains, so for an example, benzene for an example, right? So aromatics, so uh, you might have to go back into your uh, 11th or 12th uh, class uh, chemistry, but uh, aromatics are like long chains, so like C18, H32 and things like that. So what you see here is basically we are losing that as we are moving towards more and more greener fuels. And aromatics have been said to be the main component of particulate matter emissions. So this, can, this is actually leading to reduction in particulate emissions. But this can actually lead to quite a lot of other uh, impacts, like for an example, it might impact uh, the seals compatibility, how it will, how the fuel will interact with the fuel system because you don't want a situation you put a new fuel in and uh, your components stop uh, stops working i was talking to a fuel uh, manufacturer in india they took uh, auto and they placed a new fuel in and started testing it in two days all their uh, components were leaking right so uh, we've got to look at that these kind of things should not happen you can't, okay, from an auto point of view and from an IC engine point of view, okay, leaking engines, you could deal with it. In aviation, it will be a catastrophe. Right, so basically, as we change, as we, as we are moving towards more and more environmental friendly fuels, we are getting rid of the aromatics. So I want to exactly show you what it, it actually does. <laughs> 
So on this plot, what I've shown is the particulate matter size and number. So how much PM we are producing of what particular size from when we are running the gas turbines. So if you look here, these two fuels, particular fuels uh, marked here, these two fuels are currently out of spec. That means, uh, okay, technically we could put them, but they've not been approved for use in aviation. This fuel is jet fuel, the highest one producing highest amount of particulate emissions. And all these fuels, they are within the spec, but unfortunately, industry is not using them due to commercial reasons. I mean, the fuel price has gone down substantially in recent years. And um, I mean, I'm not saying about what's reflected on uh, petrol pumps in India, but overall, if you look at it, the uh, crude was about $100 a barrel a few years ago. And in Corona times, it even became negative, right? So industry was paying you money to buy some fuel. And again, it has, um, the crude price is about 40, 50, 60 these days. So it's significantly low. And if we talk about aviation fuels, they might be much more expensive to produce. So there are commercial reasons why we actually cannot use these fuels, which will actually produce lower emissions, right? Similarly, it goes for automotive vehicles as well. I was discussing again with uh, uh, organization which deals with fuel standards, and then they were clearly saying that, okay, we can produce better fuels, but who would buy them? Or they can produce better fuels to produce lower emissions, but who would actually buy them? Right, so uh, that's what the PM looks like. You can actually reduce PM substantially by changing to alternative fuels. That's what the takeaway is yet. So NOx, you can't change much. Unburnt hydrocarbon, you can't change much. CO2 emissions, you can't change much. What is changing is vibrations and noise are changing. How much? We will know it by more research. And the PM is changing. You can clearly see substantial amount of reduction. Similarly, if we uh, take uh, the smoke readings, then the smoke is also reducing substantially. Right, we're talking about one fourth smoke by some of the fuels. So th this is a snapshot I'm showing you for like 14 fuels or eight fuels, but I've tested close to 200 odd fuels in last um, eight, nine years. And uh, this is a trend which we have seen. But if I, I can't show you 800 fuels in a, or sorry, 200 fuels on a presentation. Another thing which changes a lot with fuels is your fuel systems compatibility, right? So basically uh, there was a test campaign which uh, NASA was supposed to do. Uh, and uh, uh, what they did was they filled up uh, a aircraft, one side of the fuel tank with a new fuel and one side of the fuel tank with a conventional fuel. And the aim was that they were, they were planning to fly the aircraft and measure change in emissions. What they found was that when, next day when they reached the tarmac of aircraft, uh, airport, the engine was leaking. And suddenly a test campaign, which was supposed to be concentrating on the emissions performance changed to why the engine leaked when the new fuel was placed into picture. So basically uh, in the fuel lines, we actually use different elastomer or different O-rings, right? Rubber, rubber O-rings, elastomer O-rings. And when we connect to uh, metal parts, we tighten them. And what actually happens is these uh, rubber O-rings or elastomer O-rings, when they come in contact with conventional fuel, they used to swell a bit and they used to make sure that the fuel lines are leak proof. But what exactly is happening is with arrival of some of these newer fuels, some of these fuels have been eating away material from these elastomer O-rings as compared to giving in or making them swell. And that can actually lead to uh, leaks. So that's why you can clearly see here that how the seal swell or O-rings will uh, swell when we put them in different kind of fuel compositions. You can clearly see this black line which you see, that's Jet A1. So there are some compounds which we have found which are producing higher seal swell. There are some compounds which we have found, they are producing lower seal swell, right? And historically, 
what we have observed is that uh, it was a belief that uh, aromatics in the fuel so the aromatics which were leading to higher pm and smoke emissions they lead to seal soil so th that's why we need aromatics in the fuel but that may not be the reality because we found there are some other compounds which could be actually used to get the seal soil and not produce the the p uh, the particulate matter which is to be avoided so this is a picture of that leaking aircraft which i was talking to you just now that aromatics assist in keeping the fuel lines leak free but at the same time they produce a large amount of pm emissions right so this bc mass is basically black carbon mass so with increasing amount of aromatics what exactly we see here is basically your uh, uh, black carbon mass is increasing or the particulate matter is increasing but at the same time, it was said that we need these aromatics so that the engines will actually not leak, right? So you have got to weigh a balance now and we have found that there are some other compounds as well, which we can use so that these seals will actually not leak. So in this bottom picture, what I've shown is what is the elastomer uh, swelling phenomena? So some of the fuel compounds actually leaks into elastomer and they lead, they lead to swelling of these. Right, so uh, that's from uh, seals or O-rings point of view, why fuels can actually change. So we should not concentrate just on emissions and emissions. There are a large range of other things which we need to concentrate on. Now, other thing is basically, uh, you should know it by now being aerospace students that uh, the fuel actually picks up heat from different engine components before it is injected in the injector, right? And the reason it picks up heat is that we have to increase the efficiency. And if we increase, um, if we use the fuel to take away the heat uh, uh, from the engine components, then it will lead to less cooling air requirement and things like that. And this actually leads to engine overall efficiency improvement by about one to 2%. And uh, one to two percent efficiency in gas turbines is a big number, right? So that's why we need to make sure that uh, this is uh, fuel is actually able to sustain the temperature. So what actually happens is when fuel passes through these different components, fuel gets heated up, and when it gets heated up, some of these novel fuels can actually start to clog up the fuel lines. And uh, some of these fuels might start to uh, alter how different valves and different pumps in the fuel systems are working, right? So basically recently there was a news that uh, just 20 days ago that FAA has issued a directive that uh, for all the stored aircrafts, they actually need to do an inspection because somehow uh, they are not able to start or stop the engines, right? And it's a, or change the operating condition. What I personally suspect is that the fuel was sitting in the fuel system from last four months, right? And as fuel was sitting, it might have become sticky and that could lead to actually how the systems, different pumps, different solenoid valves will actually operate. So you can clearly see that uh, from a, uh, if we heat up the fuel and that becomes a sticky while taking the heat, it can actually lead to systems failure, right? It can lead to component failure or component malfunctioning. So these can lead to catastrophic uh, losses. So we need to make sure that we are able right? So that is an important parameter which we actually need to make sure that uh, uh, fuel thermal stability, we call the term as thermal stability of fuels. So fuel thermal stability is actually maintained when we put our new fuels into the system. Otherwise they can lead to issues. Right, so um, basically in conclusions, what I would say is that NOx is unaffected by alternative fuels as more is uh, NOx is mostly controlled by engine operating condition as compared to fuel, right? 
the CO2, it's mostly uh, impact of carbon to hydrogen ratio in the fuel. And clearly you've seen that uh, we need much more work as far as sustainable fuels is concerned to make sure we reach where we want to. Right, so what's next? Basically, it opens up doors for designer fuels. That's why a lot of industry is working towards a lot of designer fuels like single component, multi-component in US. Um, there's a big uh, program going on called as Cooptima and that's for optimizing uh, uh, basically uh, fuel and engines together. And they are trying to come up with uh, fuels. I'm talking about uh, IC engines point of view, but they're trying to come up with just multi-component fuel, like one, two or three as compared to like hundreds of components in the fuel. And it's always a compromise, not just always like best combustion. It's always a compromise because you've got to think about seals, you've got to think about fuel systems, you've got to think about overall engine architecture before you actually come, uh, put, uh, um, if, if you just think about, uh, you just cannot keep on thinking about CO, CO2 and things like that. So what are other options? Yeah, hydrogen is one of the options, which I would say. And uh, if we, I mean, water also has, H2O also has uh, large uh, global warming potential. But if we fly slightly lower at lower altitude, then we might be able to sort it out. But, uh, and there are ways to reduce NOx emissions from hydrogen combustion. But uh, after 1920s, uh, Hedenberg, uh, explosion and uh, lack of research, we've not managed to introduce hydrogen in aviation yet. So it needs a lot of dollars. One more uh, important aspect which I would like to point out is basically uh, when we change the fuel, as we discussed that it's carbon to hydrogen ratio changes. And eventually what is exactly is happening is your density of the fuel will change. So you will not be able to fill the same amount of fuel in terms of mass in the aircraft as you were able to in past. So if we look at kerosene, like normal jet fuel is falling here and you were, if you were able to fly for 14,000 miles, if we change it to a different alternative fuel like ethanol or propanol, then you might be able to stick, have to live with just 10,000 miles for that particular aircraft or even 6,000 miles. So you can clearly see that uh, by changing the fuels, it's not just engine which is changing or the emissions or the fuel systems. It is actually the range of the aircraft as well. By up to 50 or 60%, you can end up reducing it when you change the density of the fuel or you eventually change the carbon to hydrogen ratio of the fuel. Right, just one more perspective before I answer your questions. This is a NOx emissions a snapshot of Zurich Airport. Okay, and so this highlighted in black is the airport and there is slightly higher emissions at the airport. And these higher NOx emissions areas are the roads leading to the airport. You can clearly see that due to airport, we have significantly higher emissions on the roads. So I think, Okay, we've learned a lot about aviation fuels, but we should be helping the automotive industry as well to reduce their emissions. You can clearly see the roads leading to airport are producing far more NOx emissions as compared to what the airport is actually doing. Right, if you have any questions, you can uh, drop me a line and uh, if you have, wait, or you can ask on question and answers now. There are a few questions which I can currently see. Um, I'll just quickly answer them. So uh, there's one query here. What is the feasibility of biofuels in aviation for now? What I would say is um, from a PR point of view, majority of the aviation industry would push for biofuels, no matter what. Right. That's, that's one of the biggest fact. And one more thing is eventually it's, uh, it falls into uh, giving back to the society as well. Like they cannot just keep on producing higher emissions. So that's why uh, 
there are aims that some of the airlines are thinking of going net carbon zero, uh, flying from like 2030, 2040. How they might do is a totally different story. They might plant more trees and then they say that, okay, we are a net uh, carbon zero uh, uh, flights, but the biofuels are moving forward no matter what. I mean, under current situation, due to commercial reasons and things like that, it might have taken a bit of hit. Uh, but um, at the same time, uh, it's moving forward. Sometimes slower, sometimes faster, depending on which governmental authority have, authorities have, are giving more, uh, what do we say, push for it, and what's the fuel price and things like that. But overall, if you look at the trends, they are moving forward. And there's another query from someone, and it's... Um, talking about the nozzle basically in this case we are just talking about how i mean how the nozzle will actually impact uh, in, uh, the noise and vibration so basically in the graphs which i've shown you we're talking about exactly the same conditions right you are running the fuels back to backs so you're not changing anything because it, the the moment we start playing with other parameters, it can actually lead to more and more uncertainty, more and more variables. So what we do is we set up the exactly same engine operating conditions. And as we set up the same engine operating conditions, then we can actually uh, compare how different fuels will behave. And those are the results I've shown. Any, any other questions from anyone? So I think there are any questions from the attendees. I think uh, Mr. Jain was saying something. Yep. Uh, so, Dian, please, you may ask questions. Oh, there's one more, I think. Uh, wait. I'm just going through it. So there is a one more question. Uh, can you tell us about the various aircraft you have worked with? I have tested fuels on um, quite a few gas turbines, but uh, like we even tested uh, emissions on behind a Boeing 747, right? But under current situation, airline industry has not been putting these novel fuels directly in aircraft because uh, aircraft testing cost millions, right? Whereas gas turbine testing on ground cost, maybe say 10, 20, I mean, maybe crore or two crores. But if you talk about uh, uh, aircraft testing, then we are talking about hundreds. Okay, one more question. Sir, what is more feasible to increase fuel efficiency of engines or to more this commercialize the use of biofuels? I think uh, we have to go ahead with both the approaches, not just one. Because if we look at future, we can't actually achieve the goals which we actually want just by focusing on one aspect. We have got to do both things, increase the efficiency as well and uh, use biofuels as well. There is also one more question on electrification of the aircrafts. Like, should we actually not concentrate on electrifying the aircrafts? I agree, uh, I mean, this question has been asked to me a number of times, and I agree electric aircrafts could be a game changer, but under current situation, if you look at it, we can't even fly 10 or 20 people, uh, like from Mumbai to Delhi, and, uh, 20 people from Mumbai to Delhi, you can't fly for now. Let's be realistic. Right. And uh, uh, even moving forward, even if we change a lot, we would not be able to fit in like 300 people and fly from, uh, say, New Delhi to New York nonstop. 
right? So we don't have that amount of energy density coming out of our batteries to actually fly long haul or even fly so many people. Okay. Thank you. So there is one more question with trifling improvements by changing fuels as seen in the presentation. Is it ideal to think about alternative fuels or should we proliferate our focus on this electrification? Right. So I think I've uh, kind of answered uh, the question uh, just now that uh, the energy density is just not there as far as uh, electrification is concerned. So I think no question is left. You have answered. So thank you, Dr. Bhopendra Ji. So for a very informative, for a very interesting lecture. Thank you very much. So now I would request uh, Professor J.K. Jain to conclude the session. Professor J.K. Jain, over to you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, sir, um, uh, at the outset, I, I would like to, uh, on behalf of MIT University, and uh, Director uh, uh, MIT Institute of Aerospace Engineering, Dr. Sanjay Singh, all attendees, and myself, I, I, uh, I thank from the bottom of my heart for a very uh, informative and wonderful lecture on sustainable uh, the f this, uh, fuels. And during this his lecture, he has uh, covered many many aspects of uh, various types of fuels and their impacts. Like uh, he has uh, discussed in detail about like uh, uh, NOx em emissions for different fuels, engine test data for uh, NOx and CO2 emissions engine test data for unburnt hydrocarbon fuels and the effect of uh, alternative fuels on on the vibration of uh, like uh, uh, flying vehicles like aircraft and also like about the particulate matter that is pm emissions and impact of aromatics and possible then looking at future, what he has suggested that possible option, one of the possible option is use of hydrogen. Mm -hmm. Because if hydrogen, in case of biofuel, hydrogen is more, and naturally the density of the fuel reduces. Uh, so uh, with this, uh, once again, I thank uh, Dr. Bhupendra Khandwal for accepting our invitation and uh, enlightening all of us on a very important topic about the sustainable uh, the fuels. Uh, sir, Dr. Dr. Bhupendra Gawal, just a small uh, uh, like uh, small query from my side, uh, like which is the which is the uh, uh, most commonly uh, fuel presently or currently used for green aviation. There is none, to be very honest about it. Okay, sir. Yeah, because uh, different companies are producing fuels in different ways. But one of the first fuel which was actually approved for to be used as a jet fuel was coming from South Africa by a company called Sesol. So that was the first, but there are not many uh, people currently... I mean, there are a lot of people producing it, but I would say in large scale, there's none. Like there are particular air airports which are blending like 20%, 30%. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Right. Thank thanks a lot, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, with the permission of uh, 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 our director, now uh, we, we conclude this session, sir. And we are very, very thankful to, to you for uh, like sir, giving this wonderful lecture uh, on the, on the this uh, like sustainable fuels and the future of green emissions right thank you thank you sir thank you very much sir <laughs>
so i once again thank you sir for an excellent talk i also thank all the attendees all the faculty members for attending this wonderful lecture and i also thank mr puneet from it support for providing and uh, uh, for uh, providing all type of support for for conducting the lecture smoothly thank you all thank you very much thank you bhupendra ji